sticks most in my mind about them is that they're both <clears throat> the warmest, wittiest, and the two of the most original people I've ever known. Robert Anton Wilson and Carl Hess. That's ten dollars each. We're, we're supposed to do our version of my dinner with Andre. Are you? <laughs> oh, it's my favorite film. Well, which one of us is oh. going to be Andre, and which one will be Wally? I guess I was born to be Wally. So <laughs> <laughs> I would start out by t uh, mentioning how I first met the person who introduced us, because I think that's, a, if I may, a story of some historic importance. When I was uh, active on the new left, uh, and therefore unpatriotic, uh, before I learned what it was like to be really unpatriotic, <laughs> I was approached one day by a young man uh, who'd been the hanging. The movement started by burning a draft card. This will have to do. Oh. Ah. I, I'd been uh, approached by this young man who, um, had the most amazing story to tell. He said that although he had appeared to be uh, interested in all of our political activities, that what he actually was doing was working for the House Committee on Un-American Activities. <laughs> but he had concluded after sober thought, that is the two or three moments he was sober, <laughs> that uh, the House Committee on Un-American Activities was considerably more dangerous than we, i.e. the new left. And so he was in his, in his mid-teens at that time. And I think this is one of the absolutely most courageous things I've ever seen a very young man do. He was scheduled to testify as a House Committee stoolie uh, on a certain day with all of the usual uh, things there. And instead, he got, he testified publicly, had to do, out, out, do it out in the hallway, that he had been an informer, that he didn't think that the people he was informing on were dangerous and that the committee was violently dangerous. This is a young, very young man. And I think he's just as uh, heroic as anybody uh, I've ever met. He's declined in his later years. But... <laughs> take a bow, take a bow. Those were great days. I was involved in the peace movement in Chicago in those days, and uh, in the 60s. And in 1972, it came out in congressional hearings that between the FBI, the CIA, and Army intelligence, there were 5,000 informers in the peace movement in Chicago. And we very seldom had a rally with more than 5,000 people. <laughs> and uh, I have been wondering ever since, was I the only pacifist in Chicago? Were everybody else intelligence agents? Oh. I know the, the circulation of the Daily Worker, the Communist Party papers at one time, consisted largely of subscriptions from the Department of Justice. <laughs> and I also, when I was doing stuff with the New Left, uh, some of the young uh, bravos in it had, were very angry at the CIA and they wondered what they could do to irritate them. And uh, so I suggested, well, hell, why don't you go out to the uh, CIA, uh, to the entrance to it, and take down every license number of a car driving in, and then go to the license bureau, uh, check the names, and publish them. Which they did, and it just... <laughs> It just irritated the CIA terribly, but I discovered in later years, I believe there were three uh, young people involved in it. One of them was a CIA agent. Well, that's right. There's, a, there's an old uh, European, uh, middle European proverb. When four sit down to conspire, three of them are government agents, and the fourth is a damn fool. <laughs> uh, that, that's, my, that, that's my experience. I, I, I could tell, uh, people wonder why I write so many novels about conspiracies. Uh, that's because I'm convinced conspiracy is one of the continuous, constant elements in human life. Uh, not that I believe there's one big conspiracy controlling everything. Uh, only hardcore paranoids are able to twist the facts enough to fit that theory. 
But there are multitudinous conspiracies. Uh, when I was in the peace movement, we had 5,000 agents spying on us in Chicago alone, as I said. When I was in the Leary Defense Committee in the 70s, that was a committee to attempt to get across to the American public an idea that was so radical we could hardly get into print with it. And it still is an unpopular idea in most places, the idea that locking up scientists is not the best way to settle scientific questions. <laughs> and most people still don't understand that idea. I don't but while get it I was, at all. <laughs> while I was in that, everybody in the Leary Defense Committee came to me at one time or another and told me somebody else was a government agent. <laughs> and at, uh, as usually the person denounced one day would be around to denounce somebody else the next day. Oh, and I oh. remain sane all through that because I have this uh, basic uh, attitude that life is either great adventure or it's nothing. So I refuse to get paranoid. I just enjoy the sense of mystery. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, at a meeting one time, uh, and this fellow, uh, after the meeting, had offered to drive me home. and. Before that, he said, come to the rear of the car. He opened it, and inside he had a Schmeiser submachine gun. And he said, would you like to have this? Well, I don't know. I've been relatively violent, I guess, all my life. And the possession of any submachine, I only had one. <laughs> and the idea of having another one appealed to me very much, but it suddenly occurred to me this was a very strange offer to make. And so I rejected it out of hand, reminding him that it was illegal. And uh, again, some time later, he came up to me and he said, I've got something strange to tell you. Thank God, here it comes again. He said, I'm working for the FBI. <laughs> and he said, I have concluded that they're more dangerous than you are. <laughs> That's a terrible blow to a, to a radical's ego. <laughs> now, I got a friend whose name it were best not to mention at this point. And he has been urging for some years the formation of a guns and dope party. And, and some, some people think that's what the Libertarian Party is. That's but, true. Uh, his, his attitude is the people who do dope and the people who are gun collectors or want to have guns to protect themselves, uh, the group generally called the gun nuts, if you add the two of them together, they make a majority. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but he's got statistics to prove this. But so many of them are in the 101st Airborne. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, there is that problem. Yeah, the small problem. But I remember one day sitting around his house, he had piles of guns, including Tommy guns around. Uh, that he was selling. He's, he's in the gun business, legally and illegally, depending on how the laws are written that year. And he also deals grass. And I was sitting there looking at him, and there's all these guns and pot on the floor. And I said, Bill, all you need is a teenage girl and some counterfeit money to be the ideal bust for any cop. <laughs> I was, uh, come to think of it, uh, a little too short for my delicate fingers. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was in the, in the gun running business uh, for a time, and uh, the curious thing, when you see the free market at work, it makes everything so pleasant. Uh, I was, more of this evil stuff, good God, there. Oh. Too late. Too late. <laughs> All right, so a party of prosperity. <laughs> But while I, while I was, this was uh, getting guns for a, um, a fellow in Cuba whose uh, uh, name was Carlos Avia. He was an engineer, which endeared him to me. And he wanted to overthrow uh, Fulgencio Batista, which was, seemed like a sensible idea. <laughs> and uh, so he uh, hired me to get him some automatic weapons and some napalm, uh, which I did fairly successfully. And, but while doing it, I noticed when, when you deal with these uh, uh, arms merchants, how wonderfully matter-of-fact they are about something that the Pentagon uh, tries to turn into a drama. You know, they, they, they're very, how many mortars do you want? We can, they were, Israelis are very big at selling mortars to people. 
we can uh, get you this many. Would you like a tank? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's, oh, no, I got So I want to describe just uh, briefly what happened in my illustrious career as a gun runner. The guns went fine. And so did the napalm, because I convinced the uh, company that makes the saponifying agent that I wanted to burn off 52,000 acres of land. <laughs> <laughs> and needed an awful lot of napalm. <laughs> but this stuff isn't, you know, you think it, it might come already uh, mixed up, but it comes as a powder. It's soap powder, it's roughly what it is. I thought, my God, there's got to be some proper way to mix this, and how am I going to tell a bunch of Cubans, after we get it there, how to mix it? So I went to a chemist friend of mine at Shell Oil who, who wrote out all of the instructions for me very seriously, and at the end, after spacing it, it simply said, and then, run like hell. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the highlight of my revolutionary activity was dropping the propaganda pamphlets over Havana. Well, I don't know if you all panic <laughs> easily, but it's, it's uh, when you're trying to figure out how in the, where was Florida, how are you gonna get back there, and uh, how are you gonna explain that you've been in all of this restricted area, and everything goes through your mind. So we had a lot of pamphlets to dump out over Havana, and so we dumped them out in bales of 5,000. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and it occurred to me, my God, I bombed some, <laughs> I bombed Havana. <laughs> so I, I really feel bad about that. I think that, that constitutes some sort of a, a, a trespass on, on them. The pamphlets wouldn't have been so bad. Anyway, it's, it was wonderful. <laughs> I'm beginning to feel I've led a rather sheltered life. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I never, uh, I have a couple of other friends who were gun runners, uh, but I've never done that myself. Uh, the closest I ever came is when the Chicago Red Squad was investigating me as a gun runner, uh -huh. which is an amusing story in itself. At least it amuses me in, in retrospect. I, I was working for Playboy at the time, and uh, people wonder how my novels get so complicated about conspiracies within conspiracies and so on. This was one of the crucial incidents in the development of my philosophy of mammalian politics. I was working for Playboy and a chap whose function was never clear to me, although he was very close to Hefner. I came into my office and closed the door. I was an associate editor. He closed the door, he pulled a chair over close to my desk and he said, this is serious. You're under very close surveillance by the Chicago Red Squad. They got a tap on your phone, and we think they're doing a mail cover on you, too. And I said, what the hell's that all about? I mean, I, I was involved in the peace movement, but I didn't think that they went that far just from watching around with a sign saying, eat what you kill, you know. <laughs> and, uh, I, I said, uh, yeah. I, I said, what? What, what did I do that got the Red Squad so intense? And he says, they think you've been running guns for the Black Panthers. And I said, running guns for the Black Panthers? I don't remember doing that. I, 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 be, I began to feel a little bit like Ronald Reagan must have felt recently. Did I, did I, did I, did I do that one day? I was so stoned, I don't remember what I was uh, Oh no, I, 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 never, I never did run guns for the Black Panthers. And the more I searched my memory, the more I realized that I had been on platforms with Black Panthers on three occasions at peace rallies. And uh, I said, how did, the, how did the Red Squad get the idea I was running guns for the Black Panthers? And this chap said, well, they got an informer in the Black Panthers. And he says, you were bringing guns down there to their headquarters on the south side. And I said, you know, I think what happened is the informer saw me with Black Panthers at times, and that wasn't good enough to excite his superiors at the Red Squad, so he improved the story a little. A Playboy editor on a platform with Black Panthers is of moderate interest. A Playboy editor running guns for the Black Panthers is of greater interest. And so I think that's what happened, because I swear, it's, uh, I think the statute of limitations has run out. If I were running guns, I would admit it now. I was not doing any such thing. 
Uh, but that's uh, probably still in my file at the Chicago Red Squad. Oh, forever. So I lived for quite a while with the knowledge that my phone was tapped and I was wondering what was happening to my mail. But I was more concerned with how the hell did Playboy know about this? <laughs> and I, uh, so I asked the, the person whose name I am carefully not mentioning, I asked him, how does Playboy know what the Chicago Red Squad is doing? And he said, well, we got a fellow at police headquarters. He tells us when an investigation is being opened uh, on anybody who works for Playboy. Uh, later on, it turned out there was an, another member of the Red Squad who was being paid by two rich liberals in the Chicago northern suburbs where the rich liberals live, Wilmette, mm -hmm. Winnetka, Glencoe, that area. These two rich liberals discovered this cop was in, a, in their peace groups. They recognized him as a cop and they approached him. And he was very glad to go on their salary. They paid him regularly to be informed of what the Red Squad was doing. So that's two agents that I have personally found out about in the Red Squad. Well, there were 5,000 agents mm -hmm. from the Chicago Red Squad, the FBI, the CIA, and Army Intelligence watching me. Yeah, that's it, the kind of world that, we, that we're yeah. living in, whether most people realize it or not. And you ch it, it depends on the side you're on, really, because I was actually uh, running guns, and uh, the FBI knew every single thing I did, but of course I was approved. You, you can be an approved gun runner. <laughs> and uh, so there was never any problem about it. Uh, that, that, really, that, that leads to another of my paranoia-inducing stories. Uh, some of you may remember about three years ago, the head of NORAID, Stood NORAID, that's aid for Northern Ireland. Uh, the, the head of NORAID stood trial in New York for running guns for the IRA. They were theoretically collecting money for the widows and orphans of the war, but they were actually buying guns for one side Let's of the war. That's just prepayment. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's right, it's prepayment, yes. And uh, his, his defense, the head of NORAID, his defense was that he didn't... Uh, believe he was committing any illegal acts. He found it incredible that he was arrested. He still didn't understand what was going on because he was getting the guns from the CIA. Yeah. And the government tried to squash that line of defense. Uh, but he, his lawyer managed to persuade the judge it was a legitimate defense. So they brought in the evidence and proved that the CIA was running guns for the IRA. And so I asked Sean McBride, who some of you may know is the founder of Amnesty International, he also won the Lenin Peace Prize, the United States Medal of Justice, the Lenin Peace Prize, the Dag Hammarskjöld Medal of Honor of the United Nations. And in Ireland, of course, with all those honors, he's still best known as the son of John McBride, who was one of the revolutionaries of 1916. I got to interview Sean McBride and I asked him about that. I asked, why would the CIA be running guns for Marxist revolutionaries? And he said, when you get into the machinations of intelligence agencies, anything is possible. Norman Mailer's uh, uh, description of it is that it really is like an onion. And you can peel it endlessly. And you'll, ne and you'll never get there because there is no there there. <laughs> <laughs> funny business, funny business. But it's wonderful if you really want a career in high-level mischief, and I must say, it's, it really is fun. I mean, God, I mean, blowing up things and stuff, it really is fun. I don't think people understand that too, too richly or too enough about war and why people, uh, there's so much support for it. It isn't part of a conspiracy, it's, part of, it's a part of an, an excitement. It really is exciting. Yeah, well, people go to see uh, horror movies. That's right. They go to see Charles Bronson blowing people away in the subway. They go to see Clint Eastwood. And they say, violence is all in the other people. I'm a pacifist. I'm a nice oh, those guy. those folks, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a part of human nature. And, of course, people enjoy it. If, if nobody enjoyed it, nobody would go to Clint Eastwood films. Mm -hmm. Some people are not satisfied seeing it on the screen. They want to act it out. It is, it's, it's just amazing how... Uh, how, prefer, how, how you can be an official outlaw in this country, and I must say it, it has some advantages. If, if, you are, if you are the state's radical, you are like methadone. <laughs> <laughs> you are the state's narcotic, and they will do, they'll help you out, they'll do all sorts of good things. Uh, just as, a, for instance, 
uh, the fellow who worked for the FBI, who was my uh, uh, who, my nurse or whatever, that this person said that the reason he had volunteered, volunteered, get this, uh, to become a, an informant for the FBI was that they had offered him to take his young daughter suffering from a very severe ailment to the uh, National Institutes of Health or Walter Reed or any place to have her worked on. So in order to save his uh, daughter's life, uh, a nice deal that the FBI made with him, uh, he decided to be an informer. It's, uh, I don't think there's any depth to which they'll sink. At least I've never thought so. But well, I, uh, let me just I'm say one thing about <laughs> that just occurred when I say IRS visions begin flashing. But <laughs> to indicate what lovely people these people are, when uh, my tax rebellion was at its zenith, which is when I had any money to tax, uh, the IRS uh, went to my mother, who was quite elderly, and uh, said that they wanted to check on, on her health. And she inquired why, and they said, because we want to make sure that when you die, you don't leave anything to your son, or if you do, we get what he owes us. Uh, I think that's villainy beyond belief, isn't it? And my mother uh, had, I, she later, uh, in talking to this young man, the, the, the agent said to her, why is your son doing this? And she said, young man, don't you read the newspapers? He's written more about it than anybody I know. And, but it doesn't do much good, does it? Except sometimes it may. I've mentioned several times that recently I, I met a guy in, uh, in West Virginia where I live, and uh, he said, I have a nasty shock for you. He said, I'm, uh, I work at the IRS uh, data center, which is oddly enough, about nine miles from us. And uh, he said, I'm about to retire. So I've been keeping in fairly close touch uh, with this fellow because I can't think of anybody more interesting than a libertarian working at the IRS central computer who is about to retire. <laughs> Malaclips, Malaclips the Younger, author of that immortal sacred scripture, Principia Discordia, oh. or How I Found Goddess and What I Did to Her After I Found Her, <laughs> is now the head of the computer department of one of the largest banks in the United States. You'll all be happy to know. And very rich, I trust. Yeah, very powerful. Yeah. But your stories about the, the FBI uh, remind me of uh, another colorful friend of mine, uh, John Draper, a.k.a. Captain Crunch. Oh. Uh, he was uh, ripping off the phone company with all sorts of cute uh, electronic devices he invented himself, including the simple device of using a whistle from a Captain Crunch breakfast cereal, which is how he got his nickname. And when he was, uh, after years, they finally made a major case against him, and he was convicted in San Jose and sentenced to about five years in prison, at which point he uh, told his lawyer to contact the FBI. And he had a conference with a couple of FBI agents in which he uh, told them how he had uh, figured out ways to tap the allegedly untappable wires of the CIA, the FBI, and the White House, and how he had worked out methods of transferring money from one bank account to another by telephone and how he had worked out a way to fire the nuclear missiles in Colorado and start <laughs> World War III. And he gave them full and explicit details on all of these little uh, pranks he hadn't had time to carry out yet because he was a busy man ripping off the phone company 24 hours a day. And they went back and they checked every damn thing he said was true. And they uh, had some kind of executive level decision and the FBI entered the case as a friend of the court and persuaded the judge to give John, instead of five years, uh, three months with weekends off. And, even, and he could go home at night, too. He was only in the prison in the daytime. <laughs> and he had weekends <laughs> off, too. He only served three months in return for informing the government uh, how to uh, get around, uh, how to install fail safes against his devices. They didn't take and after he got out of prison, he went around telling everybody in Silicon Valley the joke 
was, of course, that the fail safes he had told them about, he had already figured out how to get around. <laughs> <laughs> And what he can do, there are uh, 10,000 other uh, genius level potheads in Silicon Gulch who can also do. And they are the people who are designing 90% of the Star Wars technology. It's hopeful, isn't it? I don't it? know, these people don't appreciate my jokes. My jokes are too morbid for them. But that's, because, that's because they're true. Uh, so somebody remarked recently, Ross Overbeek as a matter of fact, uh, remarked uh, that although it has been possible for a long time for them to listen in on everything we do, that it's now possible for us to listen in on everything they do. Because mm -hmm. the technology is clearly on our side for a change. Mm -hmm. And I, But I think it will continue to be another uh, uh, hopeful sign, it seems to me. You had spoken a lot about stupidity and its, its central... Uh, activity as a tool of evolution, and I think that's an interesting thing to toy with, but uh, there, is, there is such a stupidity today that it seems to me it is forcing for survival brighter people to do extraordinary and new things, because they understand they, sim they simply can't survive the weight of the stupidity. That's my, uh, my theory is that uh, stupidity is an evolutionary driver. Right. It forces the intelligent to get even more intelligent to survive. <laughs> Yeah, boy, isn't that wonderful? My sons are going to be smart. <laughs> Wait till I tell them. <laughs> so why don't we? Uh, I believe there's a, an old cabaret uh, rubric in which uh, uh, the entertainers challenge you to uh, think of a bizarre topic that uh, that we can discuss, whether we know anything about it or not. That never stopped me from discussing it. Never me either. So somebody shout out a good topic. <laughs> what? What? Ollie? Is Ollie? Ollie North. Ollie North. Who cool I ran and Ollie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of uh, a lot of people were shocked when the National Enquirer readers voted fifteen to one that they wanted Ollie North for yeah. president, but. If, if the National Enquirer readers didn't vote that way, I would have been shocked. <laughs> uh, the, real, the real test of what's going on down there, I'm sorry this sounds snobbish, I might say up there since it's relative up down, but on the National Enquirer level, what's really going on down there, I think, is if they, put, if they made it a contest, and ran Paul Newman against Ali North, the readers would vote 15 to 1 that they want Paul Newman as president. Because Paul Newman is much closer to the ideal image than Ali North. And a, a recent sociological study shows that 95% of the women in the United States want to ball Paul Newman anyway. <laughs> well, an interesting thing to, to think about when thinking about Ali is to imagine those hearings and imagine his testimony if he had not had a uniform on. I mean, it really changes things. I mean, if your image becomes uh, the way he looked usually, uh, it changes. I think he would have been 50% less enthusiastically received. But clothes uh, are, are important. Packaging is important. Like I said in Schrodinger's Cat, blue uniforms are real. Cops are a social fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Or, to put it in the form of a Zen koan, uh, we had a little discussion of counterfeiting at the panel discussion this afternoon. We had a gallant defense of counterfeiters from Dr. Uh, Walter uh, Block. Block. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to offer you five or six uh, Zen koans in a row. Maybe we'll get the audience talking. Uh, what's the difference between a real dollar printed by the wizards in the Treasury Department and officially blessed by them, and a counterfeit dollar printed by somebody who doesn't have the wizardry and magic of the... Oh, what's the difference between a real dollar and a counterfeit dollar? And what's the, what's the difference between a, uh, a real dollar and a counterfeit dollar and one of them picked up by Andy Warhol and hung in a museum <laughs> as an example of found art? Now, if Andy Warhol found it, it would be worth around $50,000 right away once he put the frame around it. So does it make any difference if it's a real dollar or a counterfeit dollar? And uh, what is the difference between a, a, gizmo, a, 
a framed thing in an art gallery that says found dollar by Andy Warhol if it's forged by William Burroughs, <laughs> pretending to be Andy Warhol. Uh, I, I think these are, these are the questions the Austrian school did not ultimately solve. <laughs> Well, have we disposed of Ollie as a bizarre topic? <laughs> ah, now you've touched on, on my subject. Uh, suffice it to say that it is, uh, as Eric Drexler points out, this manufacturing at the molecular level, uh, that it may be uh, the last technology because it's all technologies. It means that you can make, make and produce anything either of organic materials or inorganic materials at will. In short, the world has, will suddenly become a design, a really design world. Well... Once they get the bug out of the software. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but they... <laughs> Disgrunt... <laughs> Dis disgruntled programmers everywhere you look. <laughs> God. But it's, here, Eric points out that this kind of technology is, is rather st startling and stimulating in nature. And someone had asked him what his uh, estimations were on time, and he said, my, my optimistic uh, estimation is 30 years. My pessimistic estimation is 20 years. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the sooner it comes, the more it complicates everything. Everything's beginning to be so complex now that you'd think somebody would understand that uh, there is no central uh, planning organization or managerial technique that can manage it. There's too much of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so here it, it gets more and more complex, more and more rapidly, and the only people who've got sensible solutions to it are people who aren't in it, who fight it, and who pr uh, create alternatives. Uh, I, God, I, just, I just keep feeling that, you know, we really won everything, but as getting a message through a dinosaur, it just takes time, you know? You've got to get up to that pea brain. The big brain is in the tail. The brain in the yeah, head is a much guess. smaller one. Oh. Oh, yeah. I popped into my head. I don't know why my thoughts are so disorganized, but... <laughs> you sound very organized to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to... Oh, the National Security Council is really a bizarre uh, thing. Uh, I don't know why people are, look back into the origins of these things. You, you recall that one of the great uh, ending scenes in, in, the, in my war, the good one, the Second World War, was that the, a good deal of the German intelligence apparatus, particularly that that had been aimed at the Soviet, were taken in uh, to the United States... Uh, uh, intelligence forces in toto. Uh, there's a novel called The Odessa File uh, that is, uh, as a matter of fact, an accurate description of, of, of what went on. But at any rate, all of these people having been taken in, one of the organizations created in order to deal with them was the National Security Council. It had a very specific purpose in, in dealing with all of these Germans, many of whom are still in very... Uh, uh, powerful positions in keeping this apparatus intact. So Ollie's uh, working in a, in a good place, I guess. <laughs> hmm? Oh. You, you want to start since I think you do it. Writing, writing well looked at in terms of common sense or behaviorist uh, psychology or logical positivism is a very expensive uh, neuroses. Uh, writing well means spending a lot of time on every paragraph and balancing the sentences and putting in five jokes that most people won't get and one joke that most people will get. And uh, know, knowing the nuances of words like a semanticist and the rhythm of words like a poet, and uh, doing all this, and then trying to disguise it as a commercial product so you can get a publisher to print it. <laughs> and uh, there's absolutely no reason why anybody would do it if they didn't get high on it. That's right. 
That's right. I've, I've been, I had an interesting situation with money for some time, and uh, uh, I couldn't, I, I get, I have been getting no royalties on books or anything that was being confiscated immediately. And it occurred to me, why would I still want to write books? And it turns out I really would write them, uh, I'd pay a modest amount myself to uh, <laughs> Uh, just to keep on doing it, because it's, it's, it's fun to, uh, to talk about what you're doing. Uh, I guess my views are al almost to the, uh, exactly contrary to Bob's. I think writing is what you do when you get up in the morning because it's so much fun and you never rewrite anything. You re I mean, you want to say you keep it that way and then write another one to sell to somebody else. But <laughs> So I feel, I feel differently about it. It's all... Uh, but the secret Did I make of it, it sound like I didn't think it was fun. No, not fun, but no, that, that you do the, things over and over. That would uh, well, that's the only way that you got to do it over and over until every every word in the paragraph is just right, and every rhythm is just right, and it gives you total aesthetic bliss. And you know that somewhere in the world, of five billion people, there are three who will recognize what you've done. <laughs> <laughs> but how could you possibly have failed to do that the first time around? <laughs> I'm not as smart as you. I'm still learning. Well, there may be an excuse. <laughs> I think, though, underneath it, in, in the technical sense, I think that the redisco rediscovery of the simple declarative sentence would uh, refine anyone's writing uh, tremendously. Just that. Now, I've trained myself to write long sentences and get away with it. Uh. But the first piece of advice I give anybody who brings me a piece of writing and says, how, how can I make this more commercial? is uh, divide every sentence into two sentences. Mm -hmm. Because most people just don't know how to balance a long sentence. I think that will, anybody you anybody here is trying to be a writer, you just uh, cut every sentence into two sentences and it'll be much more commercial right away. Much, uh, another thing, anybody in here who wants to be a writer and who listens to anything that anybody else tells them about writing isn't a writer. That's right, yeah. <laughs> No, the real, uh, if you want to be writers, the, the, the real inner scoop, which very seldom is revealed, especially by writers, uh, the real scoop is you want to make money as a writer, you want to make big bucks in the writing game, the first thing you do is get be internationally famous as an infamous felon. <laughs> it's too late, it's too late for any of you to get convicted as Nazi war criminals, nobody would believe you were around then. Most of you. Now, wait a minute. You might Maybe a couple. To, well, okay. You might manage to convince somebody you were involved in Watergate. Uh, uh, and if you are somehow involved in Iran Gate, well, that's you get a $3 million advance right away. Uh, but uh, for Watergate, you'll still get a million. Uh, uh, if you haven't been involved in anything on that level, you've got to kill at least 12 of your neighbors. Eight won't do it anymore. Twelve is a low estimate. Better you should kill 40 of them. And then you're guaranteed of about a $5 million advance. Uh, but if, you want to write, if you're interested in serious writing, you might as well reconcile yourself to the fact it'll be 40 years before you make any money out of it. Let's see. I was 15. <laughs> hmm. Children. If oh. you've never been hated by your children, you've never been a parent. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. I didn't invent that. I just, I was going to put the tag on it. Betty Davis said that. Oh, that's a wise, a wise and honest woman, obviously. Well, the first thing to do is to try to figure out how to, to rescue them from the government school system. Uh, I, can, I, can, I can reveal that. Uh, most people are too damn honest for their own good. Uh, most people think, well, I, I don't like what the schools are doing to my kids, I'll pull them out. And so you announce as a matter of principle, I disapprove of the school system, which offends every official in the school system and offends all the other bureaucrats. I'm going to educate the kid myself, which offends all the experts who believe ordinary people like you can't do anything without them directing you. And so you got the whole house down on you and you go through the court system and the odds are about a million to one that you're going to win. Uh, you're probably you're going to get lose and get chopped up in the court system. The intel that's what Mike Green, whom some of you may know, Mike Green calls putting a target on your back. It mm -hmm. just invites them to open fire. The intelligent thing to do, what well, my wife and I did, is write to the school system and tell them we were moving to another town. <laughs> and then we were off the records and we had no trouble whatsoever. I, I got out of school. Uh, my mother had always advised me, uh, 
uh, to not go to school, but what, what do kids know? <laughs> you know they, and I saw everybody else doing it, so I went until I was uh, 15, and when I came home, when I was 15, and told my mother that she'd been correct, and I now wanted to leave a school immediately, she just had one question, which was, how are you going to do it? You know, how, how, without getting us into trouble. And I had a, evolved a very similar scheme. I, I registered in every high school in the District of Columbia and then transferred. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard a thing. <laughs> so, uh, I think you just covered that to the advance on Gary Hart's next novel. Who's Gary Hart? <laughs> oh, he's a, he's a uh, what would, he's a fiction writer. That's, fiction writer. Uh, Is he a politician too? No, no, oh my God, no, no, not at all. No, no. Great. We were t uh, that's another thing. We we're talking about that this afternoon. How exciting it is to think that uh, you can do not not only design a house, but you could design a person. Uh, I mean, it might be. Uh, I mean, so obviously, some parents want eight foot tall kids with with hands as big as as basketballs, and I think that's then you have real professionalism. Uh, and so I think it's, but I think it's, I think it, it is even more important because I think it comes at, at an oddly crucial time in history when it is very obvious that the, the diminution of, the, of seed varieties around the world is critical and here comes at last a way to, to overcome that almost immediately. So it seems to me that genetic engineering is, it's perfectly timed. It is superbly uh, useful, it seems to me. It is, has all of the, uh, the potentially humane virtues, and that to uh, oppose it strikes me as being uh, bizarre. I, 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 I mean, there may be some reasons, but I, don't, I have yet to hear them. What I find even more exciting than genetic engineering is uh, what's happened in cryonics uh, this year. I've been, as some of you probably know, I've been involved in cryonics for quite a long time, 15 years or so. Uh, but this year in March, Paul Siegel at UC Berkeley cryonically froze a dog and brought it down to the temperature where its molecules would not change for four billion years if it were not uh, dethawed and left it there for 45 minutes and then thawed the dog out and the dog came back to life as predicted and the dog is living a happy, healthy life now, and as far as can be told externally, shows no signs of mental damage even. Because it sneezes much. <laughs> <laughs> it, it barks a lot and it pees on everything like most dogs. <laughs> That's known as the territorial uh, reflex. If you want to know more about peeing in territory, read a biography of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> huh? Uh, well, one usually comes before and or after the other. <laughs> Aren't there any complicated topics? <laughs> Who, women, what do they want? Who, women, what do they want? <laughs> Probably to be spared any more questions like that. <laughs> I don't know anything about it at all. I, I hold with, uh, with Bob that actually uh, acid was one of the great gifts uh, uh, to the human race. And uh, it seems to me that it has had no, no Ill, Ill effects on <laughs> On me, but uh, but I don't know about cocaine. I mean, I I don't think it's very funny to have a, a ruptured septum and that sort of thing. So I think uh, I don't know anything. I about explained it. last night. You can get the same effect as cocaine. Since a lot of people here who weren't there last night, I repeat myself. You can get the same effect as cocaine by putting talcum powder up your nose and rubbing it in with sandpaper and then running around burning all the money you can find in the house. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if, if you do that, 
<laughs> if you do that every day for 30 days, the effect is exactly like one month on cocaine, especially when you look at your bank account. Yeah. Guaranteed yes. to work. Mm. Well, Star you, Trek Four. Oh yeah? yeah. Oh God, I I have a problem with movies. My my favorite for years has been the the original Smokey and the Bandit. It shows you where my <laughs> my taste. Huh? <laughs> well, yes, I think so. I think Druidism still holds up for. <laughs> But, uh, I don't Actually, know, but I, don't I, I am I am a reformed non-Aristotelian Druid of North America. Well, we split off from the reformed Druids of North America uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that the uh, reformed Druids of North America, in their, in their first degree initiation, you've got to swear three times that nature is good. And uh, we non-Aristotelians felt that's a primitive and a neurologically naive statement. So we formed our own sect based on the three affirmations, nature seems good to me. <laughs> which, is in, which is in keeping with modern uh, neurology and perception theory and so on and, and quantum mechanics. And the second reason we split off is because reformed non-Aristotelian Druids of North America makes better initials than reformed Druids of North America. RNA, DNA, you see. Uh, makes a nice rhythmic pattern. <laughs> Who? Gypsies. gypsies. Well, uh, I don't... Ireland has its own gypsies. When they're, they're, when they're 50 miles away, they call tinkers. When they're 20 miles away, they call tinks. When they move in next door, they call fucking tinks. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great what? <laughs> Great jumping Jehoshaphat. Yeah, I was talking to Jimmy the other day. <laughs> uh, Ayn Rand, who asked about Ayn Rand? Yeah. I, think, I think the whole key to Ayn Rand is in the footnote in uh, Barbara Brandon's uh, The Passion of Ayn Rand. The footnote in which she mentions that Ayn Rand was taking amphetamine every day for 30 years and said some people have misinterpreted this as meaning that she became a speed freak. And then she, oh. words, and then she quotes a doctor who says maybe it affected her mind and maybe it didn't. And she said that should answer those who claim it did. <laughs> Wait a minute, the doctor said maybe it did and maybe it didn't. But who else, I, I, by now most of you have known speed freaks, right? Who else would make enemies out of so many former friends but a speech freak? And who else would think the proper way to conclude a novel is with a 90-page speech? <laughs> Nobody but a speech freak would think something like that was <laughs> belonged in a novel. Wouldn't you say that both Conrad and Jimmy Hoffa are concrete bound? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> i tell you one thing. I, uh, I went through a, a, a brief uh, period of... Uh, uh, going around acting as though Ayn Rand was a pain in the ass and all that sort of thing. And I sort of regret that because, as a matter of fact, I don't know anybody. I know a lot of people who are outraged by her, but I don't know many anybody who wasn't affected by her. Uh, I think that... <laughs> I think she really, uh, she really did, did a lot, and to criticize her for... Uh, uh, this thing and that thing, what the hell? People will forget that. I am inclined to like the original just a teeny bit better, though. I think Max Stirner is uh, somebody we should read uh, with some regularity. Well, maybe, I, maybe I like Max Stirner better than Ayn Rand because I never met Max Stirner. <laughs> <laughs> Bizarre personal habits and why they are important. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anybody with any bizarre personalities. <laughs> yeah, but they are important. That's, I think you put your finger on something there. <laughs> what was that? What? Slack. Slack. Oh. That's... Slack 
is the state of perfect enlightenment and attunement and ideal balance. It cannot be understood by the rational mind, <laughs> like most of the great concepts of mysticism. One needs to have direct intuition into the essence of slack before one can begin to express slack. But a crude understanding for domesticated primate minds might be achieved by considering that the universe consists of something and nothing. Uh, if you see this glass of water, you're seeing something, but if you look all around it, you see a lot of nothing. When you get down to the atomic level, this is even more pronounced. The further down quantum mechanics goes, the more they find of nothing and the less they find of something, until the suspicion is growing that if you get to the bottom, it'll be all nothing and no something. Uh, that's known as superfluid vacuum. It's very important in some interpretations of quantum mechanics. When you get to the bottom, there's nothing, and the something just appears as a temporary bubble on the nothing. Well, anyway, uh, it's figure and ground is the gestalt way of thinking of it. And uh, the figure is something and the ground is nothing. Only the figure seems to be an expression of the ground, so it resolves into nothing eventually. But you don't have to get that deep. I mean, we were almost approaching Buddhism there. For practical purposes, the secret of power, slack, <laughs> arises when you are ideally balanced between something and nothing. And then you can get something for nothing. <laughs> and, uh, and those, those, those callow rationalists and shallow empiricists who think this is mystical bullshit should stop and reflect that this is the principle by which Bob Dobbs founded the Church of the Subgenius and got rich. Mm -hmm. This is the principle behind Rajanish and Ayatollah Khomeini and Jerry Falwell. This is the principle behind every religion in the world. You can get something for nothing. <laughs> All you got to do is repeat at the end of every sentence and send more money, brothers and sisters. The what? Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I've been with so many of those folks and they, they keep talking about a new age and describe it in minute detail in terms of a uh, hundred years ago. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, there, there really is, there's a strain of Luddism with a lot of these folks. They, well, I tell you this, if I owned a ski lodge uh, near Aspen, and uh, the Muzak people all played my music and I had billions of dollars and things, I probably would figure, what the hell, be nice. Let's have a nice simple place uh, to live in and, and, uh, and let's pump the water uh, by hand and let's uh, bake the bread uh, and so forth. And uh, so if you, if you have enough servants, uh, you can get all of this done very nicely, but most people, uh, I don't think most people want that sort of new age. They, uh, they want whatever happens next, and uh, I think, oh my God, I'm gonna wax serious for a moment. What nonsense! The, Do it I, before serious waxes you. Yeah, right. <laughs> serious, one of the more, more important stars, of course. If you the, if you like to do it doggy fashion. The dogs. That's right. That's right. Hunter gatherers. Huh? Hunter gatherers. Yeah, that's. Yeah, right. I, I, I hunt at the A&P now and <laughs> gather there and stuff. And that was one of the things I remember. Do you ever realize most people are still at the hunting gathering stage? Uh, mm -hmm. Engineers and a few others aren't, but most people, if they closed all the supermarkets, would have no idea how to That's feed right. themselves. Right. They're in the hunting gathering. They haven't mastered agriculture yet, like oh. Carl has, for instance. Yeah. This is, uh, I tell you one thing, I don't want to denigrate for a moment the, the knowledge of how to do all of these things. It's just that uh, doing them full time is not quite as much fun as, uh, oh, that somehow reminds me. I was a me. farmer for two years, that was enough for me. That's, but if you uh, like it for 20 years, that's your life. I'm yeah, <laughs> not, not me, I, I, uh, I rem oh, what did I remember? I didn't remember. <laughs> huh? Neighbors? Oh, yeah, well this is, see, I'm, I'm not a, uh, what, uh, what you'd call a, uh, a believer in rights. Uh, so I believe in agreements and contracts. And neighbors are the people that you most constantly are making contracts with. Just in, in meeting them, in having any sort of uh, uh, concourse with them. And uh, they, are, they are politically the most important people in your life. 
And it <clears throat> just occurs to me that a person uh, who has a lot of trouble with their neighbors and uh, then pretends to solve the ills of the world is starting from a very shaky foundation. <laughs> I think the behavior of people toward their neighbors is as crucial as their opinion uh, about epistemology. And so I take neighbors very, very seriously. That's, you, know, you were talking Buddhism a while ago, and now you're talking Confucianism. Oh, God. Yeah, Confucius put that as the basis of everything. Can you get along with your family? And the next step is, can you get along with your neighbors? Oh. And then after that, you can study philosophy yeah. and figure out the ideal system of government. You know, that, just as an educational aside on that, it occurs people are always saying you shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. I've said the happiest moments in my life have been reinventing the wheel. And I, I believe this is probably true of uh, things like Confucianism and Buddhism and Libertarianism and a number of other uh, things, that uh, inventing it yourself, discovering it yourself is just a wonderful part of the experience, much better than knowing about it is discovering it. I, I've been very excited by that. Yeah. Water skiing with your favorite judge. Who? What? Water skiing with your favorite judge. Water skiing with your favorite, favorite judge. judge. Oh, in my case, that would be Hugo Black. Yeah. Hugo Black was the first member of the Ku Klux Klan appointed to the Supreme Court. <laughs> that you know about. That we know about, yeah. Very, very, very few people approved of his appointment at the time. Uh, yeah, that was back in the 30s, and uh, Hugo explained, well, when I was young, I was a salesman, and the only way you can make any sales in that part of the South is if you knew the Ku Klux grip. That's why I was a Freemason, too. <laughs> and people howled and screamed, and Hugo served 30 or 40 years on the Supreme Court, and he became my personal hero, uh, because he refused to look at the material in censorship cases. He had an absolutely consistent policy he said, I don't care what it is, it's protected under the First Amendment. Oh, and uh, <laughs> in, in one of his dissents, he wrote, I believe the men who wrote our Constitution were masters of 18th century English prose style. I believe that when they wrote no laws, hmm. as in they, there should be no laws abridging freedom of speech or of the press, they meant no laws. <laughs> I believe that if they meant to say some laws with their <laughs> gift of style, they would have found a way to say that clearly. <laughs> some, some on this court, with an ingenuity that astounds and almost convinces me, have argued that when they wrote no laws, they meant some laws. But oh. I'm a simple farm boy, and to me, no laws still means no laws. So he never looked at any of the material. He voted not guilty in every censorship case oh. while he was on the Supreme Court. And I wish we had more like him, even mm. if he did start in the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> Anybody can reform, you see. Pork, pork. Pork? Pork. <laughs> You know, he's, I think he's, he's a very curious uh, fellow. Uh, uh, he worked for me once in, in, in an earlier life. <laughs> and uh, my feeling is that, that his position roughly, his judicial position, is that the legislature actually is supreme. He's, he's curiously uh, different from some of the criticisms I've seen, so that he really feels that if, if the uh, legislature uh, decides anything, that isn't clearly contrary to the wording of the Constitution, that he supports the legislature. Now, so judicial activism previously had been sort of stepping in uh, to negate or to uh, uh, contend with the legislature, but I don't believe he'll put up with it. So I don't know where, where that puts him in, in terms of the court. Did you say who? Psychiatry. How many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> Only one, but it takes a long time and the light bulb really has to want to change.
Uh, Thomas says. Oh, I, uh, I'm on the agree column. I um, I agree with his conclusions, but I disagree with some of his arguments. <laughs> uh, he, uh, I, I disagree with him about uh, schizophrenia, for instance, being a matter of definition. I tend to believe it's a genuine physical disease and mental. will probably be cured by yeah. chemistry. Then it's not a mental disease. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I said. I agree with him on uh, how we should treat people. But I don't agree with him in arguing things like there is no such disease as schizophrenia. I believe I can uh, recognize the difference in complexion between schizophrenics and non-schizophrenics, mm -hmm. for instance. And there's a different smell in many cases. I believe it's a very real physical condition. And uh, I don't think it's clarifying matters at all to say it's a matter of definition. Wells that don't hold what? Oh, wells that don't. <laughs> God, I don't know. I, I did the, uh, the most welding I've done in a long time, about two weeks ago. I did 80 feet of uh, flat wells on a big flatbed trailer to uh, carry an experimental boat that some friends of mine built. And because I hadn't done much electrical welding lately, since I moved farther out, or well, in the country I use gas all the time, uh, and I hadn't done much electric welding for a long time, and the first two or three inches were just incredibly puddly, bad, really ugly. I fortunately had a grinder uh, handy, so I could smooth them off immediately, uh, pretending a sort of super fastidious uh, attention to my welds. And, but after about three inches, it was just great, and I, I think it was 80 feet straight through, and uh, caused some people to gasp and say, man, that's a lot of welding. No. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yuppies and puppies. Oh, I think I think it's uh, one of the most odious uh, uh, cliches of our time is this business of frowning on yuppies because they want things. You know. Well, I think yuppies are a social myth. Nobody, I've never met anybody yet who has been willing to stand there and say, I am a yuppie. Mm. There are no yuppies. It's not like the yippies. There are a lot of people who said, yeah, we're yippies. There were people who said, we're beatniks, we're hippies, uh, different words at different times. But nobody ever says, I'm a yuppie. Somebody invented the word yuppie as a way of dismissing the ideas, the behavior, and the, oh, yeah. and the personal existence of somebody they didn't like. And this word has been picked up because there are a lot of people who find that there are a lot of people they don't like and are glad to have another bad word to hurl at them. It's not polite to say nigger anymore, for instance. So people of a nasty temperament are hard up to find pejorative nouns. And yuppie came along to relieve them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And that's the thing I object to. Whether they exist or not isn't as important, it seems to me, as the fact that they're criticized for this horrible thing of thinking about themselves as important and wanting things. And can you think of any healthier definition of a, of a, of a nice, of a good neighbor than somebody who meets these criteria? They think of themselves, they want things. My God, it's just wonderful, and yet they're criticized. Of course, they're criticized by columnists uh, uh, always who have indoor tennis courts, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Matthew Hoffman. Matthew Hoffman. Oh, God, I don't know. I, 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 what can you say uh, uh, about him? I, I, I'm glad I'm out of that. Oh, shit. <laughs> I think it's, it's an interesting minor technology, but I swear to goodness, it's, it's, for old people, it's neat. I mean, when your mind's going and you don't have anything else to do. I think the most fascinating thing that's happening in television is that uh, nobody I know in the United States, I, when I'm in the United States, nobody I know and visit uh, looks at network television anymore. This came to me very gradually over the last two years in coming back here on three lecture tours, and it's gradually percolated. Nobody I know looks at network television. They don't look at public television 
either anymore. They, all they look at is video. So yeah. television has become a library. Instead of being something you're being force fed, you have a limited yeah. choice of which channel of garbage you'll turn to. Uh, now you go out and buy uh, rent or buy a uh, video like you used to rent or buy books. Yeah. And so it's becoming an expression of the personality of the user. I think that's a revolutionary and nobody yeah, realizes how revolutionary yeah. it is. I think it's the best part of it. I got, uh, we got a VCR through, through a most curious uh, means, I'm suddenly reminded. I had a new aortic valve installed and uh, in my belief that the original design is not perfect. <laughs> and that if human beings can do a little bit better. But I had this, so I was uh, really out of it for, for, for some time. And our neighbors uh, chipped in and uh, got us a VCR. And they, they just got enough to rent it for a couple of months until uh, one of them had the good sense to write Barry Goldwater a letter. So he sent them the balance. And uh, now, thanks to our neighbors, we have this VCR. It's, uh, and these, these, these are people who uh, are, these are the very people criticized by people in Washington uh, uh, for not being open, charitable, kind, and so forth. And yet they are the most charitable uh, people that I know of. And uh, that was a very nice VCR, but great. Yeah, you're right. It's a great thing to have around. What would I watch next? I watch, I have this habit. I must, I'm addicted to a certain film. I own a film. <laughs> and this, this film is called The Wind and the Lion. <laughs> and the reason I like it is because I think it is beyond any question the most romantic film I have ever seen in my life. And uh, I have to see it at least once a month. Because uh, it, its ending lines uh, are so wonderful also. It's a discussion between two people who've just been through hard, very dangerous times, and now they've lost everything. They have nothing. And one to the other says, wouldn't it be terrible to never in your life have had anything important enough to risk it all for? And I thought, boy, that's right. That's, uh, that's important stuff to... to uh, to do. Favorite books. Favorite book. Principia Discordia. Finnegan's Wake. Digital tape recorder. Hmm? Digital tape recorder. Well, a little pricey so far, but uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll get sick again. <laughs> huh? Oh, boy. I didn't. <laughs> Not so much the campaign, because you know all about that. I think the more interesting one was his campaign to return to the Senate. When I was then a member of SDS and was working with the Black Panthers fairly regularly. And uh, he still wanted me to come out uh, for his Senate campaign to write some speeches. <clears throat> so I took off uh, to go out there. And as a, good, as a going away present, my friends, well, I lived on a boat at that time, and my friends in Associated Boats had given me a, uh, a piece of hashish that was exactly the size of the largest Hershey bar you can buy. <laughs> Except considerably thicker and said uh, to go out and do good work for the senator. So I got out there and the first thing was that they wouldn't let me register at a dis distant motel with my name. They had me registered under a false name and I was never to come near the office because I was a pretty well-known hippie. And um, they'd bring stuff out, and I'd write these speeches, and it went, it went quite well, particularly the speech at the University of Arizona that began, so help me God. I have much in common with the anarchist wing of SDS. <laughs> <laughs> and he then went on to, <laughs> to talk about what this anarchist dream meant. And he thought that was, uh, that was funny. He came in, I stayed in his pool house uh, also, for a time there, and he came into the pool house one day, and he, what did he say? Oh, he said, I haven't smelled any of that for a long time. Then he started talking, you know, it was Arizona where this crazy uh, uh, drug uh, officer got the idea to outlaw everything because he said he saw crazed cowboys all of the time. Goldwater described those times when uh, everybody was uh, smoking grass 
and how he thought it was fine and to describe everything along the line. He couldn't understand why anybody had ever made it illegal, went on and on and on. His position on that was just uh, inspiring. I wish we'd known about that 64. It would have... <laughs> Although he had things that were almost as bad uh, politically. Uh, he was on the ham radio one day in 64. Always. I mean, that's most of the time in the airplane was spent restringing antennas. And he was talking to somebody in one of the Carolinas where we were headed for him to make a major speech. And this person said, Senator, what do you think about the right of a communist to speak on a campus? And the senator said, just, you know, two hams over the radio. He said, well, I think that uh, if they pay taxes and it's a public place, they ought to have a right to speak there as much. And went on and on like that. So this made headlines the next day of him taking this position. And isn't it interesting that the headlines were made by his opponents? Because it's assumed that anybody who talks like that uh, is incompetent. And this is from both sides. Oh, that was an interesting part of the campaign. He was ahead of his time on awareness of ecology, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, I think he was because he lived in a in a very sparse uh, area where you could see connections rather quickly. Artificial intelligence. If it's intelligent, it is artificial. Ronald Reagan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nostradamus. Yeah, yeah. Well, mm. <laughs> Look, anybody can predict the future, right? <laughs> he is the classic example of uh, following Heinlein's advice. It does not pay a profit to be too specific. Natural <laughs> <laughs> law. I, I got a card uh, given to me that makes me a genuine and authorized illuminated one. A uh, member of the Secret Chiefs and a professor of the Invisible College, only it says void where prohibited by natural law. <laughs> so, I'm, uh, I'm very happy I don't believe in natural law, so this card can never be invalidated. Right. <clears throat> well, I don't, I, I, I keep thinking of natural law in terms of it. If I go out into the field near our house and proclaim a right of any sort, I keep waiting for the agency that is going to uh, uh, enforce this right or even make it palpable. On the other hand, if I walk up the hill uh, to a neighbor and we discuss something and we mutually agree that henceforth we will be as gods or something of that sort, then I say that is not a right, that is an agreement. And that's perfectly natural. Amen. So I don't know. I, <laughs> All this, I, I guess this stuff is important, but I keep asking myself, is, 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 suppose you know somebody who believes in or doesn't believe in natural rights, which you do, obviously. Now, what will that belief or disbelief, difference will it make in the ordinary Congress of life as, you, as this, uh, this person is a neighbor? Will it mean that they won't show up when your barn is burning? Uh, will it mean that they'll rustle, rustle your cattle? What does it mean, actually? Does it have any bearing on the way people would behave? And my feeling is that, look, there are a lot of things that are fun to debate about and denounce people over. That's certainly a fun. But on the other hand, it should be taken into account that these differences that people have may be meaningless differences. And that I think you should start, we should all start assessing these things in terms of what difference does it make in the person? Uh, yeah. Unnatural act, if it's an act, it's natural. <laughs> That's it. So called intellectual property rights, and if, since you're both computer literate, a, a specific interesting case is one like Apple's claim to have the exclusive use of a particular way that a computer behaves. Mm -hmm. I think they're, they're very difficult to enforce. I think they'll become impossible to yeah. enforce very shortly. Uh, well, they've yeah. never been. Well, they've always been sort of crazy. I mean, as, as it has been pointed out time after time, they protect the person who gets there first, uh, who may have had a better trolley or something. It has nothing to do with the, the idea. I, I've been my understanding all along that 
libertarians uh, were glorified, among other things, by the fact that they very early on had attacked the copyright laws. So, I... But you're both authors. Yeah, sure. That's. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that the copyright laws, uh, maybe they protect us in some technical sense, but I'd be happy to sell things in a, uh, in a free market. Do you mind if I took debt of politics and sold it to uh, make a profit without people, cutting you in? People are doing it all the time. Look, I made money off that. I mean, I figure somebody bought it. It's not mine anymore. The IRS is doing it too much. And people do it. People do it constantly, and I think it's fine because if I were asked to, to, to do it again today, I'd say I'll do it on condition that a lot of people read it. And uh, this way uh, may help it. Yeah. The world of wrestling. The, wor the wonderful world of wrestling. Yeah. I'll let you handle that. <laughs> well, I think the first thing that we've got to think about is who we're wrestling with, with whom we are wrestling. Yeah. So we think about that. Do you want to specify the sort of match you had in mind? Professional wrestling. Oh, pro well, okay. I have a notion about professional wrestling, if that means profession professional athletic. I think this hue and cry against not teaching football players to be astrophysicists is really wretched. There should, I mean, there's a course for everything else in college. Why in the hell can't there be a course on professional athletics? <laughs> And then you could drop all of this crap about these people who should be educated and so forth. Hell, they're there to learn a trade. <laughs> and, I don't, and I think they should be permitted to do it without being aggravated by a bunch of English teachers. <laughs> I believe even policemen can be rehabilitated into what useful trades. Oh, yeah. I think. Football is one trade most policemen could be taught. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> fairness doctrine. It's gone. Hooray, hooray, hooray. <laughs> yeah, it was never fair. It wasn't much of a doctor. Yeah. Old age. Who? Old age. Oh, God, what a pain in the ass. <laughs> it's better than the alternative. It is that serious. <laughs> it, it should go on forever, but. Reagan doctor. I think one of the worst things about it is seeing people who are familiar, and it used to be that when I saw people who were familiar, I'd say, God, maybe that's their son or daughter. Now I realize it's their, either their great, their grandchildren or even their great grandchildren. And this is, I woke up one morning to realize that I'm older than Jimmy Carter. Uh, this is, God, this is terminal oldness. Most men my age are dead already. Yeah. Uh, favorite toys, yours or somebody else's? What was it? Favorite toys, yours or somebody else's? Oh, somebody else's. No, I can tell you about mine. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite toy of all toys was the inside of an electric train, just the, uh, the motor. It didn't have any of that silly business on it. And I, I thought that little motor moving around those tracks was the most wonderful thing I've ever seen. That was the most important toy in my life until I read Euclid. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> it should be done by, by uh, libertarians. Libertarians have got to make some breakthroughs like that. So that my favorite breakthrough is that a libertarian could come up with a really hot cure for virtually all forms of cancer and refuse to administer it to collectivists. <laughs> that that Are you saying she's she copyrighted? No, just refuse to give it. I mean, if you give it, you've lost it. I think that's the thing. I mean, uh, Lisa, that seems to me the way it is. <laughs> oh, I think that's, I mean, they're, 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 they're here, there are things like that, and there are more and more th exciting things happening. And I think that she made us, us I really think that the, I think the field today is, is, is in the organic sciences, in biology and botany, and with genetic engineering. I just think that's a, a, a major, major field. For a time, it'll outdo a lot of the mechanical ones. What periodicals? 
do we consider? I guess that you think we think are good. Oh yeah, I can tell you mine very simply. I wouldn't indispensable technology review, which is MIT's uh, magazine, uh, Popular Science, a little newsletter edited out uh, in California called Manus, which I can't expect that anybody would have uh, read. And uh, I have. You have read. Fine. Well, it's called, it's called Manus. It's uh, it's just a funny little. Uh, Philosophical magazine. I just love it. <laughs> you ought to let him talk about his magazines first. Maybe one of them is Harper's. Bizarre. No, my favorite magazines are the New Scientist uh, because yeah. I live in Ireland and uh, it's more convenient to get it from England than to wait for Scientific America to wind its way across the Atlantic. And Brain Mind Bulletin, which is worth waiting for her to wend its way across the Atlantic because it has all of the most uh, important uh, research on the nervous system and the brain that's going on now. And to me, that's where the action is. Mm -hmm. The nervous system and the brain, and especially those ever-loving peptides. <laughs> Who? Intimate domain. Oh. Well, that, I suppose, leads to the question of whether you can own any property anyway. And it just occurs to me in terms of real property, the fact of the matter is you can't anyway. Nobody in this country can own a piece of real property. They have to rent it uh, from the government. So I, uh, I suppose that eminent domain is, uh, is very similar to that. No wonder it's been hard to argue away from it. But property taxes make it rented property. Oh boy, like uh, you know, like Stirner, I, th I think it's good to read some of the, uh, the the old uh, folks. <laughs> when Gordon Liddy got out of jail, he was asked a bunch of questions, and he said no comment to all of them until he got to his car. I saw this on television news. He was getting into his car. One reporter tried one last question: Do you have any comment on the prison system? And Gordon Liddy turned around and said, "Anything that doesn't kill me makes me stronger." Yeah. And I suddenly realized I had a common bond with Gordon Liddy. I, I recognized our common humanity because that's my favorite quote from Nietzsche. When we find the cure for AIDS, we will have longevity because AIDS is based on the breakdown of the immunological system, which happens to all of us as we get older. And once they find out how to stop the accelerated breakdown, that will inevitably point the direction in how to stop the later breakdown mm -hmm. that happens with senility and so on. So we will learn how to uh, uh, um, reconvert the immune system to the resistance it had at around the age of 18 to 20. And then we can uh, go on indefinitely, getting higher and higher all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? Space colonies. Uh, I want the first one to be named Proxmire. Have you got have you got a favorite one? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, my favorite uh, was when I was Hans Zoyser, born in 1740 and died in 1812. Uh, he was a member of the Bavarian Illuminati, and he was he was there on the day they initiated Thomas Jefferson in Paris. And uh, he knew Voltaire personally, and he's buried in a churchyard in Vienna. And I got all this under hypnosis. And one of these days, I'm going to go to Vienna and look for that tombstone. And if I find that tombstone, I'm going to be the most surprised son of a bitch on the planet. Because <laughs> I don't believe in reincarnation. <laughs> voting in what sense? If it's voting on the national committee, I say absolutely not. <laughs> but if it's, if it's voting for dog catcher or sheriff, 
or that sort of thing, I'd say, sure, voting for sheriff is one of the most uh, significant survival acts that you can make in your, in your neighborhood. And if you, if you don't pay attention to it, you're just missing a, a great point. I, uh, I think this, this, sec, this, this notion that you, uh, you support the system or uh, verify it by doing this is, is not necessarily correct. If voting could change the system, it would be illegal. Yeah. <laughs> if, not, if not voting could change the system, it would be illegal. Yeah. Girl, I can't believe in your friend in the IRS who's so close to retirement because you wouldn't have endangered him. Yeah, well, I don't think that uh, uh, he's actually going to do anything. I've despaired of the project so far. It wasn't a period quite. It was uh, whatever. Yeah, I think you're right. Is this a party or a revolution? Is this 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 thing here, or do you mean what's this? Oh, this this party. Is it a party or a revolution? Well, you know how I feel. I, I hate to get in trouble again, but I think. <laughs> yeah, I think that I think the libertarian movement is uh, is considerable and is uh, is serious. And I think that it is a mistake to confuse the movement with any component part of it. And so uh, I presume this is a bunch of people who are in the libertarian movement who have chosen to do a certain thing, and that that is simply uh, something that they have chosen to do. Uh, but I, th I think it is a, a movement. I think it is. Uh, I think it is coming along uh, at, as most movements do. It's coming along. Yeah, this is some sort of weird determinism, I guess. But I believe the tools uh, create in, in their wake the, uh, the sort of social organization that they, uh, they need to progress. Or it may just be that it makes it possible. But I think that, um, that libertarians represent a way of thinking which will be absolutely essential to the utilization of the tools now being designed. So this, uh, this I, is Wilson's fifth law. Primate behavior only changes under the impact of new technology. Yeah, well, I, I think that's, that's a very serious thing. I take it very seriously that that's what is happening. and that uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing the world can do but move toward liberty because the, the technologies are simply too uh, decentralizing and too complex to be handled by... Uh, uh, there's there's little room. There's, there are not many jobs for idiots in the in the long future, uh, although there are plenty today. Forty-two. That's the that, that's the that's the answer to the uh, why does the universe exist and what is the purpose of life. Uh, that is the that is that is the answer to is there anything that doesn't make sense in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> Take peptides into your heart, brothers and sisters. <laughs> you will be better for it. Your neighbors will be better for it. Uh, I am determined not to think so. <laughs> <laughs> Some people say the I Ching gives meaningful answers. Some people say computers give meaningful answers. <laughs> the Turing test of intelligence is, does it give meaningful answers? I think computers and the Yijing both pass that test. So I, and by the Turing test, they're both intelligent. I find it very odd that people who believe the computers are intelligent regard the people who think Yijing is intelligent as mystics. Now, the people who believe Yijing is intelligent regard the people who think computers are intelligent as materialists. And yet, basically, it's the same question. The question is, does binary notation of itself generate form and coherence, which it seems to do. Not, uh, not as funny as Muslim television. <laughs> oh, one of the greats, absolutely. The world hasn't been quite the same. But he's coming back, isn't he? A sticker. Who? Oh, that's great. That's wonderful. My favorite bumper stickers are in uh, descending uh, order. I, 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 you can see all of these on the California highways. Um, 
If guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns. And the second one is, if guns are outlawed, how can we shoot the libertarians? <laughs> uh, Lyndon LaRouche. And the third one is, if laws are outlawed, only outlaws will have laws. <laughs> which, which, is probably, which is probably Douglas Hofstadter getting into the act. And the final one is, if marriage is outlawed, only outlaws will have in-laws. <laughs> Which I think, I think is a translation from the Hungarian. The original is actually more correctly translated as how many surrealists does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> and the answer is a fish. <laughs> of course. My favorite bumper sticker currently, because we, uh, Therese and I do uh, a tutoring of adult illiterates uh, where we are, and. There's one bumper sticker we have actually seen that says, illiterate question mark, right for help. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's like the signs. There are these signs uh, all over the United States that says, no dogs allowed, except seeing eye dogs. And the question always comes to me, who's supposed to read that, the blind man or the dog? <laughs> Euclid. James Joyce. <laughs> nope, Euclid. <laughs> what was that? You see, you're asking something. You may have touched a nerve with that one. I could even, I could be planning it. <laughs> What would it be? Barbecued potato chips, no question about it. <laughs> Just tons of them. <coughs> Barbecued potato chips. <laughs> peptides. <laughs> Barbecued peptides. <laughs> You know, before he, in his last interview before he died, which was with a, a, a libertarian lady in California, he said he was quoted as saying, "I am an anarchist." Mm. Buckminster Fuller. His conclusion had been, uh, roughly echoing some of the things we've been saying. His conclusion was that it just won't work. You can't plan it. Uh, it just won't work. You've got to let it go and let people uh, take charge of themselves. And, I don't know if he, he would have. It's just that uh, here is a question of somebody who had reached one conclusion. He may still have a number of other uh, conclusions that may seem odious, but having reached this very significant one, uh, I'd be uh, happy to have him over. I and found it fascinating that he got grouchier as he got older. As sublime as he was, uh, he was one of the most serene, beautiful people I ever met. But I, re I remember how how he uh, policed himself and constrained himself against ever saying anything critical about another human being. He made that one of his disciplines, never to criticize uh, other architects whom he regarded as idiots. But he was very careful never to say that explicitly. And he would never criticize, when he had to criticize things that were going on, he would specify the people who did this thought they were doing right. And I saw him on a television show in which uh, Cupsonet asked him, what do you think of the Hancock Building, which was just put up in Chicago then? And Bucky looked uh, terribly embarrassed and uptight, and he started staggering toward an answer, very unusual for him. And he said, I, 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 I don't like to think harshly of my fellow human beings. And that was more devastating than he said if it was 110 <laughs> stories of shit, you know? Oh. <laughs> he was struggling so hard to be nice. But then... Uh, and at the end of his life, uh, I did an interview with him in which he said, Ronald Reagan is a dumb actor who can memorize his lines, and that's the only thing I care to say about him. Mm -hmm. And uh, in his last book, he said, the mafia has taken over most of the businesses in the Western world, and they're one of the four most dominant influences. And everything that has to be done to, uh, 
handle spaceship Earth intelligently and make everybody as rich as they should be will all be opposed by the Catholic Church because the Pope knows as well as I know that if people are well fed and happy, they won't need a lot of ignorant superstitions anymore. And I said, what's happened to Bucky Fuller? He's, been all the, he's finally let out all the anger of 87 years. You know? Older architect story installment too. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, was given a, a prestigious award in Philadelphia one time, and people spoke interminably before uh, he was introduced uh, about him. And so when he rose and went to the uh, podium, he said, ladies and gentlemen, my address is Taliesin West. He walked out. <laughs> ah, good stuff. Carl <laughs> who, who is what? Are you delegates? Can you vote? I can vote, yeah. I'm going to vote for Jim Turney. <laughs> for, I'm sure, thoroughly idiosyncratic reasons. And you, huh? Oh, Nostradamus, we, we've dismissed him some time ago. <laughs> billions and billions. <laughs> Ralph Nader. Uh -huh. Ralph Nader, don't get me started on that subject. I, I, I have been traveling around the world in the last five months. I've been flying from here to there and back and forth. I've been from East Germany to Maui and uh, back across the United States a couple of times, and I'm tied up all the time I'm on the planes. I'm trussed up like a turkey, and then I get off the planes, and I think I don't have to be tied up anymore, and I get in a car, and the first thing they say is, we got a new law. i got to tie you up before I can start the car. So i got to be tied up in the cars, too. And some days I fly six hours tied up on the plane, and then I get in a car, and I'm driven two hours tied up in the car. I'm spending more and more of my waking hours trussed up because that son of a bitch Nader is a bondage freak. He wants us, he wants us all tied up forever. And you know, you know, the, the, the next crusade he's going to start, we're going to end up. We're going to be say we're going to have to have belts on at our word processors so we don't fall off the chair and hurt ourselves. This is for our own good, of course. Yeah. I thought it was only the English aristocracy who are into this bondage thing, but there's a definite sign of it, not just in Native, but in a hell of a lot of the ecology movement. I get, I get mailings from a group called the uh, Friends of the Vanishing Malaria Mosquito. And they claim the, the malaria mosquito has been decimated so much in the last two decades that and throughout vast areas of Africa and Polynesia and uh, parts of South America where this species numbered in the billions and billions, and then, now they can only find five or six a year, and it's one of the leading the contenders of the endangered species. Mm -hmm. And you can see a direct quote, you can see just how bad it is looking at the malaria death figures in human beings every year. It's been going straight down, right. which shows there are hardly any malaria mosquitoes left. And if we don't stop this carnage, the fiendish <laughs> villains in the chemical industry will kill them all. All down to the, and I read this stuff and I'm trying to figure out is this satire or is this for real? <laughs> it's real satire. <laughs> Richie, I got, I did, I did a little work for Nixon and in a conversation one day while I was wor working with him, uh, a young fellow uh, who later became an ambassador to the UN, as a matter of fact, uh, said that. Uh, was there, and he'd been working on, on Nixon's book, and then there was there also the fellow who'd written the first biography of Nixon. The biographer said, I think I'm gonna write a novel about Nixon. The Nixon uh, other person who was there said, how can that be? I've always understood that a novel had to have a central character. <laughs> and I always say that was the most perceptive description of him. I mean, no, really, no character is the, is the thing that is so. I think he was a good president. God, he'd probably go down as one of the great presidents of all time, considering how much better he was than any of these birds who followed him. But uh, I think he's a person of no character. He lucked into everything he did, I suppose. Oh, I think that's, I, I think that is just terrible. I've, 
I worked in, in Southern Africa, I worked in Rhodesia for a while, and I just think it is the, the cruelest thing that can be done to, to, to in any way isolate those people. Because uh, there's so many South Africans who really uh, uh, want it to free up as a, as a society, who make it a, a free market society. There, there are people like Chief Budalese who even feel that uh, uh, for uh, black Africans, that this would be a, a useful exercise. And to isolate all of this, I just think it's criminal. I think that also, I think that the work that Leon Lowe is doing, a libertarian in South Africa, is probably the, the most important libertarian project uh, in, the, in the world today. It has... And, and the reason I, I, I say it mainly is that it, it has a, a, a real, there's a real possibility of its being effective, in which case uh, libertarian history would change very quickly. Possibly so, yeah, sure. I think that the, the notion that one of the cantons of, of South Africa would be a free market, a canton in, in the, uh, up against uh, competing, if you will, with, with some collectivist uh, cantons is, is exciting beyond belief. Well, I don't know what their position would be. Uh, Leon uh, is, is much more, op it seems optimistic about it, that they, they would not uh, violently oppose this, so. Is it true that they uh, wipe out any moderate I, d I have no idea, I have no idea. Feeling, but, feeling with crime. Hmm? Dealing with crime. Dealing with crime or dealing with criminals? Oh, did, well, I dealt with a criminal uh, for a time. I wrote a book for a uh, a mafia uh, guy who was really absolutely fascinating to show you roughly his stature in, in the mafia. His lucky Luciano had been his father's driver. So, and this guy was just marvelous to, to work with him because, uh, oh, you know, he, there, there warms to the story of how he helped his mother kill his father's mistress. <laughs> uh, the family that slays together. Uh, uh, all. He had this, this one, he, when he was a fairly young man, he, he had been one of the, just getting used to being a criminal, he and some friends had decided to rob a non-mafia gambling joint. This is, you know, their fair game. Incidentally, this guy told me that, that the mafia's arrangement with the police regularly is that whenever the police need an arrest of any particular sort, they will tell them who to arrest because it'll be a non-mafia person. So the police is, are constantly wiping out the competition. Uh, but this fellow, uh, when he's, he was telling me about his family life uh, and all in this, this good decision to go raid this gambling place, they burst in, they had shotguns and submachine guns, all of the proper equipment, and they had the proper protocol of uh, shouting and yelling and uh, threatening everything. They did everything just right. But he said it was operated by a bunch of Chinese. <laughs> and he said, and I'll never forget this phrase, he said, those people have no respect for authority. <laughs> he said, we, we told them to... Uh, you know, to do this, that, and the next thing. He said, they just stood there and looked at us. <laughs> and he said, I'll tell you one thing, I'm never going to rob a Chinese again. <laughs> he said, and the, while we were working on it, he's, he wanted to know if there's anything that would ease my labors. And he said, uh, woman, girl, boy, any. And then we got down to the interesting question of narcotics. And he said, what would you like? And I said, well, some, some marijuana would be pleasant. And he said, oh. He said, you know, we've got to buy that just like you do. He said, we can't control that. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you know, everybody can grow that stuff. He was, and he was absolutely outraged <laughs> about it. So I, the answer to, to, to crime also is the free market. Expose them to some serious competition, and we will. Uh, uh, you know, because as a matter of fact, the world is. There are certainly things in the world that are more pleasant than, than being a criminal. 
there are some sociopaths, uh, although uh, I guess and maybe the question always is, what if one of them comes crashing through your window? And I got to confess to you that I uh, really believe in aggressive self-defense. And uh, where I come from, the, the answer is very simple. That evolution is speeded on its inevitable way by eliminating the unfit. Now, the way to start a new country, uh, well, Panics has an excellent book on that, how to start your own country. But one of the methods they left out is you uh, go down to Laredo and you go down about 10 miles south of Laredo with some Confederates. You need a little capital to get started. You put up a shack and you put a chain across the road and you stop all the American tourists as they come down. <laughs> and you search their car and you pretend to find cocaine. <laughs> and then, then you lock them up in the shack for three days. And then another of your Confederates comes in pretending to be the American ambassador <laughs> and says, this is really serious. They claim they found two and a half pounds of cocaine. And the poor victim says, I wasn't doing it. I swear to God, I'm a businessman from Des Moines. And the American ambassador says, well, there's one way to handle all problems in Mexico. How much money have you got? <laughs> and so well, then the officials all get bribed and the poor Mark is allowed to drive on into Mexico with no more money on him. Because as W.C. Field said, it's a sin against nature to leave a sucker in full possession of his assets. <laughs> and so then you wait for the next one to come along. And within a couple of months, you got enough money on that, you can put up a shack on another road and a shack on another road. And the money comes in more and more of them. You get your own army, your own navy. Eventually, you have your own nuclear deterrent. And then you're a country. <laughs> that's that's the way the Normans went about it, more or less. <laughs> Voluntary compliance. Oh boy, boy. there was uh, the state of Ohio. We we have a little quote from this uh, in the upcoming issue. Uh, uh, the tax commissioner wrote to businessmen about their this some some new tax thing. And it was about voluntary compliance, and that was voluntary compliance, period. Next paragraph, if you do not voluntarily uh, comply, you can expect to be visited, investigated by agents not only of this department, but of the tax departments of the adjoining states, so forth and so on. So I guess that's voluntary compliance, <laughs> government style. Mm. Oh, God, that's... Uh, that's a terrible thing that is happening to her, and she's a, a very courageous about it. The worst thing from a libertarian point of view, however, is the reaction to her candidacy, uh, which included the reaction of some Californians that she had ruined the party, or that the party had been ruined by her candidacy. I think this is, a, this is something libertarians have got to be, the, the, be careful about, to not spook so quickly uh, when, when something a little different comes along. She, she did well. I don't think she hurt the party at all. I think, as a, as a matter of fact, she must have, must have helped it. I, I wrote last issue about something that I, th I think uh, is germane to, to, this, to the Norma Jean question of, of whether you should support those in your movement who are the most uh, uh, unpopular at any given time. My notion is that un perhaps unfortunately, yes, you have to. There's, I wrote, wrote last time about a group of uh, punks, punk rockers that I'd met in Toronto uh, who are estranged from the Toronto party because they really are not very classy dressers. And, uh, and yet listen to what they do. They remodel and resell slum housing. As a consequence, their little group is, uh, uh, is rich. They are very rich, and they continue to do this. Their neighbors so rely on them for help that they have constituted the sort of the neighborhood protection uh, people. When there are robbers in the neighborhood who are known thieves who are preying on, on poor and very disorganized Chinese, this is in Chinatown, I should have mentioned, they come to these punk uh, rockers uh, to help them, and the punk rockers are, are quick to respond. One of them, as a matter of fact, wears an interesting necklace of the 
a teeth of one of the last uh, people. <laughs> one of, you know, so they know how to handle brigands, and it occurred to me, good God, here are these people. They have privatized self-defense. They are rich, which more libertarians ought to be. They, uh, they are uh, practicing uh, their culture exactly as they like. What could possibly be more libertarian? And I think those are the things that uh, every now and then we've got to understand that liberty means liberty and that some of the people exercise it in the most untidy ways. But to fail, to fail to defend anyone in the exercise or, the, or the, they're seeking to attain liberty, no matter how odious their practices may appear to you, I think is a very serious mistake. Hmm? Jay, that's his field. <laughs> Forbidding me those barbecued potato chips for my last meal <laughs> would be rest. Truly, offensive. I don't know. It's pretty hard to offend me. I offend a, I offend a lot of people, but uh, it's very hard to offend me. Uh, the other day, I uh, went up to the concierge to mail a letter, and he had a sign on his desk that said, "Thank you for not smoking." So I said to him, "Thank you for not picking your nose." And, uh, <laughs> He looked, he looked all bent out of shape for about five minutes afterwards. <laughs> and yet you know, I, I just thought that was, that was just a, a, I thought a minor bit of surrealist uh, witticism. But it, uh, it's very easy to offend some people. Oh, but then again, oh. as John Cleese once said, there are some people one wishes to offend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, allegory, I don't know. I don't know how much allegory there is in Joyce, but every sentence has uh, been worked on with great precision to give it at least 18 different meanings, uh, uh, about 13 of which are scatological and five are metaphysical. Uh, well, that's an average ratio. Sometimes he does better than that. Uh, but uh, no, you uh, you don't have to invent meanings in Joyce. He puts so many meanings in that it's uh, almost a full-time job to find the ones he put in. You don't need to go around inventing any of your own. He, he said, uh, when somebody asked him why, uh, why he was writing such a queer book as Finnegan's Wake, he said to keep the PhD candidates busy for the next thousand years. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> After 38 years on it, I'm convinced, I'm absolutely convinced uh, that boast will be justified. After 38 <laughs> years, I feel I'm beginning to acquire the knack of recognizing how many funny things are going on simultaneously in that book. Well, the portrait has uh, the portrait has a great deal in it that doesn't appear on the surface. It is worth rereading several times if you really want to understand uh, the man who probably was to literature what Einstein was to physics and what Picasso was to painting. Ezra Pound. Mm -hmm. Ezra Pound. <laughs> The last, uh, the last lines Pound ever wrote, I have tried to write a paradise terrestrial. Stand still, let the wind speak. That is paradise. May the gods forgive what I have made. May those I love try to forgive what I have made. At the end of a 900 page poem, those lines are absolutely magnificent in their simplicity and in how much they contain. Okay, that's my comment on Ezra Pound. That's great. Joseph Conrad. I prefer Faulkner. Mm. <laughs> Mad Magazine. <laughs> <laughs>
I prefer the National Lampoon. <laughs> I prefer the National Enquirer. Dan <laughs> Rather. I don't know anything about Dan Rather, but I tell you, I leaped to the support of a guy named uh, Brian Gumbel, however. He was criticized in the Washington Post recently because he has he interviews people on 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 television, he was criticized for uh, treating them brusquely. It was said that he, he had on important world figures and he sometimes treated them as though they were uh, nothing. And he was rude to them and so forth. And so I've written something about that in defense of Gumbel. I mean, he's treating them exactly the way they should be treated. And who is to say that, uh, that this young man, who's now a, a, a network, uh, person and interviews people, who's to say he doesn't know as much about uh, anything as, as uh, government officials or so forth. I think this is a terrible uh, habit we get into of thinking that, uh, that public figures are somehow uh, endowed with superior intelligence. Hmm? I wonder about it a lot, but I, th I think not. Newspapers. Uh, yeah, there are some of them around. <laughs> I, th I think the key to politics, going back to the last question, is that nobody ever ran for office who wasn't sincerely convinced of their own tremendous charm. I think ordinary people occasionally have doubts about their own magnetism and charisma and their ability to sell bullshit to anybody. <laughs> but the politicians never doubt. Like Nixon never doubted. At the, very, at the end of Watergate, when he was resigning, he had that look in his eye like, if I say it just right, they'll believe me again. And they'll say, Dick, don't resign. And you got to have that kind of, yeah. that's, that, that's all you need in politics. You don't need anything else. Well, you've got to, it's almost impossible not to acquire uh, such habits of thought. Think of, think of, 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 of a, a politician from, from United States representative up. It really begins with. First of all, you have paid people to follow you around and do things and tell you that you're the best thing that ever happened because their jobs all depend on your being this. And so you hear this constantly from people who have a vested interest in doing it. So you believe it very quickly. I mean, who, who wouldn't? It would take a, a, per, a person who's run for office uh, uh, surrounded by such people. I mean, look at libertarians. I mean, what is everybody's great nightmare? that there'll be some libertarian candidate who will take it very seriously and will exercise power once he gets in. It's, it's, it's the, the nightmare, and it's what anti-party people say is bound to happen. Well, we worry about that. How can we fail uh, then? Well, how can we be surprised then when we think of ordinary politicians uh, bowing to the pressures of power? It's just irresistible. Has anybody in, in the room worked at the White House? Uh, well, let me tell you, I, I have for a while, and I challenge you to, to think of how you would resist it. Think of a situation in which there is no activity on the face of the earth that will not stop for your presence if you want it to. That is to say, if you call up any place, uh, any airline, any store, any, any, any organization, from the White House and say that this should happen at this time, it will happen. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, right. That, I wish I'd known about it because when, when, when I was there, it's just irresistible, good God. And you can be out on a friend's boat offshore anywhere and a helicopter will come for you, that sort of thing. I mean, it's no wonder that these people think that they have the answers to everything. Everybody tells them they do. And well, this as Mel Brooks said in uh, The History of the World, part one, being king is good. <laughs> Remember that? Remember that? Boy, it sure is. That's... Huh? They reflag your boat. They reflag it. Oh, no. You know, everybody gets code names, too. You know, and when you have a code name, that's, that makes you think that you're... That you really are special. I forget. I really do forget. Oh God! I but I I know the the feeling you get when an airline has been held on the ground for thirty minutes uh, for you to walk on 
casually but mysteriously <laughs> onto the plane with everybody hating you and with it not making any difference at all. <laughs> I mean, how can you fail but to believe? My God, everything I think, everything I do is, is correct and powerful. Boy. Or vitamin C. We, we had the vitamin supplement question. You have a comment on his uh, abilities as a chemist? I hear he's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I still think maybe Owsley's a little better, but. The sooner the population sheds government, the safer it'll be for all us misfits. We're sort of gathered here to do something to hurry up the process. The subject is off the wall methods for doing that. I got a favorite one. I don't know. It's so simple that I, 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 I just wonder about it. It occurs to me that in an effort to help your government uh, go about its appointed task, one of the things they want is a, are a lot of tax returns. They want everybody to file them. So it occurs to me that possibly some ill-tempered person might decide to pick names at random from the phone book and make out their tax returns for them. <laughs> and assisted by a properly programmed printer, they should be able to do this at a high rate of speed. <laughs> so that instead of having X number of uh, tax returns coming in to delight them, they will be dazzled by the fact that they're X, 2X coming in. Or 10x. Or 10x. I mean, if you can really get the thing cranked up. And what would excite them even more is every time you were in a post office, you picked up three or four <laughs> tax forms, make them out for fictitious names, Not fictitious. wrong addresses, and then add the things up so it looks like you were very clumsily trying to hide $4,000. Right. <laughs> so they will audit that one carefully, and they'll go looking for that person. And that'll keep them busy especially if they get millions like that. That's right. Or I don't know what the morality of this would be, but it seems to me picking names at random out of the, out of the phone book is just going to make them a lot more, uh, there'll be a lot more critical people. Yeah, that's true. That could be a... Carol, didn't you want to once go around the IRS building with a giant magnet? Well, I no, well, yes, but I, I realize that's uh, impossible. But I think I keep thinking of interesting uh, uh, scenarios involving air ducts and uh, magnetic particles. But you know, that's just really foolish. That stuff's so redundant that it wouldn't do any good. I think you, you can't you can't re you can't abolish the government. You, I think what you the only way that can possibly be affected is to overload it. And, and put, No, I think that might be uh, uh, making it a bit bad. Just, just something that would cause, uh, you want to cause trouble not for them, but for the IRS. So you'd... Uh, they won't get audited for six or seven weeks after they receive the tax. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it really wouldn't be their fault, would it? <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's one of my... interesting to play with. I, in one of my immortal novels, I have an organization called The Network, who are a bunch of computer programmers who are concerned with cocaine and immortality. Uh, they, they want to bring down the price of cocaine, and they want to support life extension research leading to possible immortality. And uh, one of the devices of The Network is to frustrate every other conspiracy on the planet so they can deflect funds the way they want to. And one of the things they are doing is erasing computer types. Since they're all in the computer business, they're erasing computer types selectively, and they send notifications to people. Congratulations, you are one of the lucky 500 this month. All your debts have been canceled. Keep your mouth shut and play it smart. <laughs> uh, Schrodinger's Cat, Volume 3 which is about to be reprinted, by the way. I'm doing a commercial for myself in public. Isn't that disgraceful? <laughs> 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 
out of it. <laughs> well, I, uh, I'll plug that too. Randy Lang Henry, who is sitting back there, and I have just uh, finished a book called Capitalism for Kids. And we got page proofs the other day, so I guess it'll be out pretty soon. It's, uh, <laughs> we, we asked uh, a number of people for contributions uh, to the book, I mean, anecdotes about uh, when they'd started to work and that sort of thing, and the White House declined uh, uh, to do it. And the, and the reason was that the White House cannot be involved with any commercial operation, which is just absurd because he's always uh, plugging commercial operations of one sort or another. But nonetheless, we, do, we did act... Uh, who was the, uh, the secretary uh, who just, Baldridge, the late uh, Malcolm Baldridge, we got a wonderful contribution from him. It was, it was sympathetic to the notion that, that children should start working as soon as they're inspired to do it. Not working, but creating wealth. And it was, it was a good, uh, good note. We got a lot of good replies. David Packard, interestingly enough, was angry about the concept of the book, and he, he wrote a very angry letter, which we... We've used it, and his reasoning was that he, as he says, he said, I never did anything in my life for money. He said, I did it because I loved engineering. And I believe that that could be true, but it hasn't, he hasn't given it back or anything like that. <laughs> and so we tried to handle it by, by just pointing out that as a matter of fact, uh, the love, love of engineering and doing good engineering is almost inevitably going to make you rich. And so uh, he, shouldn't, he shouldn't criticize this. Uh. The question of whether you're sending that book to the White House reminds me of another question that brings us back to the earlier topic. Are you all sending your urine to the White House? <laughs> now, this, is, uh, this is a very low surrealist tactic, almost pataphysical, but I didn't uh, invent it. I'm just uh, reporting. I'm a journalist, you know, part-time. Ken Kesey has urged everybody in the country who disapproves of this urine testing program to send samples of urine to Nancy Reagan at the White House. Because uh, she's the one who first suggested that uh, idea. And since she's so obsessively concerned with everybody's urine, we should right. see she has plenty of urine day after day from now on. I'd like to learn that LP news about that. Can you pay for it? <laughs> You know, speaking of piss, Neil Smith has the most ingenious idea for solving the Middle East crisis I've heard. In as much as the Reagan administration is determined to settle it by force of arms, he says he thinks it would be fairly simple that you just inform the Ayatollah that on a given day you're going to fly over it with tanker planes which will release a, a, a hog piss. <laughs> and this will co this will coat all of the uh, the people uh, in in the area, and they have to go through an elaborate uh, purification ceremony. And you point out that if uh, you know if they still don't come to their senses uh, and permit McDonald's in immediately, <laughs> fly over again and do it. Sounds like an interesting uh, proposition to me. All we're saying is give this a chance. Sure. <laughs> That's right. That is so. Urination. What? Urination. Oh. <laughs> Speaking of new nation projects. <laughs> That's great. Mm. That is similar. It reminds me of my FBI informer again. He said he thought that the, the best thing you could do to really irritate them would be to send them a schedule. And I thought that's an ingenious idea. I mean, I don't care. So I did try that a couple of times, but I've learned that it doesn't pay to do things that you take humorously uh, <clears throat> to do these pranks with the government because they don't take anything humorously. <laughs> As I, I, a couple of years in a row, I thought it would be fun to owe them a lot more money uh, rather than less, so I put down as my income $100,000, $200,000, and uh, said that I wouldn't pay tax on that. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've lived to regret it. My bill just shot up, you know, and there's no possible way to prove that you were, you can't go in and say, look, I'm a funny guy. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't take me seriously. <laughs> 
So I'll, uh, yeah, one of Groucho Marx's wives divorced him because when they were coming back from a trip to Europe on the uh, customs declaration where it said occupation, Groucho wrote opium smoker. I mean, opium smuggler. <laughs> and uh, they were held for about 12 hours while the customs people did all sorts of weird police type things. I, uh, making calls here and there and going through their luggage over and over and whatnot. And uh, Groucho's wife did not regard it as funny at all after eight <laughs> hours in custody. They have no sense of humor. Yeah. Oh, okay. Doug, uh, Doug Casey recently came up with what I considered to be the best comment to a public servant of the month. He was somebody, a customs agent, was really giving him a thorough search. And Doug, very seriously and not uh, in a, uh, an abrasive way at all, said, sir, at what point in your life did you decide that you'd spend it going through other people's underwear? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the inclination is to get angry with these people, but just ask the Socratic method, is it good? You've got to be calm about it. They don't know how to handle calm. I don't know, why in the hell should he resign? Oh, God, that's, oh, yeah, oh, what the, oh. Speaking of people with no character, that is just, I, I don't know, that's, I, I don't believe he'd do Why that. in Texas, everybody, I was in Texas recently, everybody tells me, well, George is a good old down-home boy from Connecticut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, he, he did give us such a brilliant example of what that politics is all about. I mean, to think of the way he denounced Reagan <laughs> until he got to be vice president. <laughs> yeah, and, so, and so, you know, suddenly, because Reagan is the nominee, all of those criticisms are now invalid. Uh, doesn't show a depth of conviction that I would take terribly seriously. I think the funniest book I've read all year is The Triumph of Politics by uh, David Stockman. Oh, yes. About how he got converted to voodoo economics because he thought Reagan could win, and how he tried to practice voodoo economics and found it didn't work, and tried to explain <laughs> that to Reagan and became the most unpopular man in the White House. Uh, that's an extraordinary book. I don't think I've ever read a book, though, that was more self serving. Oh, yeah. God, what could you expect? Just amazing. Well, perhaps it should. Be requ it'll be required reading. I'll tell you what should be required reading. I've thought about this for some time. Uh, there is a good book on American polit politics, and that's Hunter Thompson's Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail. And it just occurs to me that, that we should all push to keep that one going because it it reduces it to some, uh, some raw data that are important. God, I, I, we used to, what's this fellow's name who writes about the presidential campaigns? Theodore White. He, uh, of course, was present uh, quite a bit, and I, I could not believe this. This guy's a groupie, <laughs> merely a groupie. He really thinks that politicians are extraordinary and wonderful people. He takes everything they do seriously, and he writes these books about it, as though people in politics think about things. Uh, you know, why, he explains why they did these things. And most of the times I was there when these things happened, they were done because it was possible to do them. Nobody had any serious objections. Say, hey, that sounds like a good idea. You know, it's, it's, it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong to think that, uh, that politicians uh, are in any sense contemplative about these things. I'm just reading Joe by finding it uh, yeah. in the notebooks. I, uh, Lazarus Long's prescription of what it means to be a, a human being, I think, is as sound as any I've ever read. Mm -hmm. Boy. Max, you said what, what a human being should know? Oh, you know what a human being should know brings up this uh, best-selling book, uh, Cultural Literacy, right? I sense something happening. Uh, 
I think, well, I, I, this, this got some context. Let me try to explain this. I have an old, old friend I used to know very well on the left named Jeremy Rifkin, whose, uh, whose work it is in the world is to find causes for alarm. And that's the way he makes his money. <laughs> find a cause of alarm. So lately he's found a two. Uh, one was uh, genetic engineering and most recently surrogate motherhood. And uh, he has tried to figure out why these things are bad. And of course he finds no nothing wrong in, in the real world, so he has to go to the other world. And his objections in both cases have become religious, absolutely religious. That is to say that uh, genetic engineering is unnatural. It is not the way God uh, uh, works these things out. Although, uh, if, if there was ever a master genetic engineer, it was the God of the Christians. I mean, he did, he's the, is the orig original design, they say. Uh, very, very contradictory folks. But at any rate, there's, uh, there's that happened. And then, what was the other part that we were talking about? Cultural oh, yeah. So I think there's a trend to start justifying uh, uh, policies religiously much more. And, and this is the Sandinistas are doing this. They're, they're very religious folks, those Sandinistas. Now, I think that cultural literacy will now be a, a version of this. There will be a great push in the educational system to say that one of the problems with America and the world is that we do not share a culture, that we, uh, we've grown apart from one another. We've become selfish individuals. And that the way to restore this is for people to be taught this common cultural literacy. Now, the book Cultural Literacy uh, not only uh, expounds this theory, but lists the 500 things that a culturally literate person in America should know. Uh, not one of which I can think of makes any con would make any concrete difference in anybody's life. But I think what, it, what was happening is that there's so much concern with the, uh, no with the number of young teachers in this country who are beginning to emphasize thoughtfulness and inquiry among their, their very young pupils, that there's a, a great deal of concern about this, so that uh, a number of conservatives particularly will be very avid in pushing for the shared culture concept as opposed to individual creative intelligence. And uh, I just think that's the opening gun. That's uh, I mean, of something very important. As for what the average American should know, I'm, I'm constantly uh, astounded uh, since I moved to Europe. Every time I come back here, I'm astounded at what the average American doesn't know. Uh, for instance, uh, the average American doesn't know that Northern Ireland and Ireland are two separate countries. And people keep asking me, why do you live there with all those bombs going off and all those shootings and everything? Well, no, there's no bombs going off and there's no shootings in Ireland. That's in Northern Ireland, which is a separate country. And I'm astounded how many times I've had to explain that. I'm even more astounded that I got into my head to explain it one more time when nobody even asked me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm, beginning, maybe I'm becoming a Christian scientist. I think if I explain it the right way, nobody will ask me again. Have you converted any Irish to uh, libertarians? What? Have you converted any Irish to libertarians? Um, no, but I do write libertarian letters to the Irish Times, which you get very intelligent responses from Jesuits proving I'm uh, theologically unsound, <laughs> which is a verdict I agree with. And... Uh, very, very uh, violent and abusive anonymous letters sent to my home. Uh, Irish newspapers, they still have the old-fashioned practice. They print your address along mm. with your name. And so I see the best and the worst of uh, Catholic theology. The best comes from the Jesuits, and the worst comes from these people who say, you must have brain cancer to write that kind of nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think Drexler's book is just crucial. It's an important book, and uh, it should be read. Uh, to not take it into consideration might, would be rash. I believe that the, the other book you mentioned, The Closing of the American Mind, is roughly part of this, this push. 
uh, towards some sort of uh, uh, cultural uh, coherence as opposed to uh, a continued emphasis or an emphasis on individual creative activity. And uh, I, I believe we're, this, will be a ser this will be a very serious question and I don't, I think we'll have uh, more arguments uh, in the future than we've ever had before on this issue and that we'll, we'll have to remember very, uh, we'll have to remember that libertarianism does involve individualism and that we will have to uh, understand that we may be fighting not just on economic issues, but possibly even more importantly on cultural issues uh, in which the other side will have a great deal of sympathy because it sounds exactly right. Wouldn't we all be better off if we all had studied what I studied? That sort of thing. And it's, it's, it sounds good and it will attract a lot of attention. And, and the contrary, which is encouraging uh, thoughtful processes, analysis, arguments, uh, and uh, so forth, uh, it sounds unruly, chaotic, uh, but I think it's, the, it's a crucial question for all of us. I think the most important book I've read in the last year is Mega Brain by Michael Hutchison, uh, which is uh, a very good uh, uh, manual on how to use the human brain for fun and profit. I've written a manual on that topic myself, but I won't mention its name, lest you think I came here only to plug my books. Uh, Michael Hutchison has done a very good... <laughs> Michael Hutchison has done a very good update on all the latest knowledge on neuroscience and all the evidence that the brain was not designed for failure. The brain was designed for total success in the universe and to do things most of us regard as impossible. And the technology and the knowledge is emerging faster every year. And uh, take peptides into your heart, brothers and sisters. The best is yet to come. Mm -hmm. And popular fallacies, wasn't that the full title? <clears throat> was it? Yeah, very popular book with uh, conspiracy theorists of my generation. <laughs> oh, I don't know stuff in general. Huh? Mind control. Mass delusions. That, that brings me back to the counterfeiting yeah. thing again. Two people sit, sit down in uh, different places in the same city and they each make dollar bills. And one is real because it was blessed by the wizards in the Federal Reserve Bank. And the other is not real because it wasn't blessed by the wizards. Now, hardly anybody in this country today will say they believe in that kind. They, they believe in medieval magic. And yet they do believe that the one blessed by the wizards in the Federal Reserve is real and the other one isn't real. So extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds and the belief in these funny pieces of paper. <laughs> That's right. It's like the funniest piece of paper of all is, I swear to God, it's that little tag on mattresses and pillows. <laughs> I mean, you can't feel terribly safe in a, in a universe where, where people will tell you that you can't take it off because it's against the law. That's, that's I always rip them off, just on general principles. Yeah, before reading them. That's <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a... Huh? Uh, a demigod uh, should be uh, revered by all of us. Mm. And you know, the thing that characterizes him that I think is so much lacking today is that he really insulted lots of people <laughs> <laughs> who badly needed it. And I think that that's a habit we've got out of. Uh, yeah, he did insult a lot of people, but then the, the man who said, uh, the man who called Harding D'Amelio the Stonehead and, and said Herbert Hoover was the first president to look the same upside down. Yeah. Uh, a, man, a man like that wasn't all bad. Oh, no. <laughs> he, said, he also said FDR's conception of the government was a milk cow with 200 million tets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's right. You know, in earlier, uh, William Pitt had said that in bear baiting, 
It wasn't the agony of the animal that irritated his parishioners. It was the joy of the spectators. <laughs> When flashing? When flashing? <laughs> you mean, of course, the installing of flashing on, on roof eaves. No flashing lights, apparently. Oh, no, I don't know about this. This. Oh. The, the, thing, the thing that amazes me about the signs is uh, the things you get every time you enter another country. You always get these things that tell you, welcome to the Republic of mm -hmm. the people and, and how glad we are to see you coming here and we want to make you stay, stay a pleasant one and now please fill out these forms. Warning, if your answers to any of the above are not true, you are subject to 20 years in prison and $400,000 <laughs> fine and so on. We may possibly take out your back teeth and execute your children in front of your eyes. These, these things are horrendous. Mm -hmm. They start out with this false cheer and then they end up threatening you. Jesus, what a nice place to arrive. They're, threatening me. They're going to put me in prison right away. <laughs> there's another, along with the little tag on, on the pillars, there's another depressing sight. And that is somebody at three o'clock in the morning with no traffic within five billion miles stopped at a stoplight. <laughs> that is uncanny. For jaywalk? I got a sign, he says, that I promised to respond and direct it on this notice or else he hauled me right off the jail. Take away the walking license. You gotta say your <laughs> This you mean? <laughs> I, I live in Ontario, he said. Is this your current address? So he made out the ticket. God, <laughs> this is jay jaywalking, you mean? Uh, Oh, in, New, God, I in New Jersey, the police department has signs up all over the state now that say, crime does not pay, but we do. <laughs> and then they give you a phone number to inform on your best friend because oh. they'll pay you for it. Oh, and I've been yeah. suggesting to all the libertarians in New Jersey, they should put a new sign up next to each one of them. And this would just say, don't suspect a friend, report him, which is from Brazil. And see how long it took any of the people who support that kind of police action to realize that the second sign is a satire. <laughs> they might take it as seriously as the first Absolutely. sign. You know what happened, uh, has happened characteristically when the Declaration of Independence is shown to people. Uh, <laughs> the most notable example I remember was that uh, some students from the University of Maryland did it at an American air base in Germany. And they asked several questions. The first question was, who composed it? And the second was, would you sign it? The, over, the favorite or the most frequent answer to who wrote it was Lenin. And the overwhelming answer to would you sign it was no. Uh, and it's, incidentally, we recommend that uh, local libertarians uh, uh, might find this a useful thing to do in their own community. Uh, that, uh, that experiment has been done many times. It was done mm -hmm. during the First World War. It was done repeatedly in the 20s. It's been done over and over. And it's every time the results have been the same. The majority would mm -hmm. not approve of the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. And there have been similar studies where the majority overwhelmingly rejects every item in the Bill of Rights. If this country were a democracy when it was founded, we wouldn't have any of the rights we do have. The people have never supported that kind of document or that kind of libertarian thinking. We owe that to the fact that a few aristocrats conspired to create this form of government against the will of the majority who would much rather have the right to tyrannize over any minority that comes along. 47% of uh, students, uh, I guess high school students in America, think that to reach according to his ability to reach according to his needs is part of the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> it, it, well, I may be closer to a perception of reality than we are. <laughs> <laughs>
But you know, that's, that's, uh, this, this, this emphasis on, on the shared culture uh, will mean probably that the, the, the Constitution will be emphasized and the Declaration will be just sort of forgotten. It'll be said the Constitution is more important. That's the, I mean, shared culture never means just sharing everything that you found out about where you live. It's a very specific uh, uh, menu of items. <laughs> yeah, that's well. You got to admit that the country, among its other fantastic virtues, uh, one of them is that it is shameless, <laughs> and uh, I rather like that. I, I, I don't. I, I, the country is so extraordinary, and the people are so creative and so gen a lot of them that. Uh, Oh, God. I, yeah, I, well, a country that has a Statue of Liberty that says, send me your poor, your, hud or your, your, t your huddled, hurdled masses, your what masses? Yeah. Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free and doesn't, do and doesn't have the simple honesty to carve the thing over and put in there and make sure 80% of them are wasps, mm. which is the actual policy. But they won't, they won't put the actual policy on the statue. That's what I'd do. I'd have the balls to do that if I was in charge, and that was going to be the policy. I've been Let's trying be to get about it. Yeah, I've been trying to get started for some time a, a sanctuary program for Hong Kong millionaires. <laughs> <laughs> they don't put it on the statue. They put it on the statute. Oh, yeah, the statue, right? Yeah. The, the statue. And like the Jefferson, the Jefferson uh, Memorial. And it says across the top of it, I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility to every form of, the tyr every form of tyranny over the mind of man. And the next sentence in the letter that comes from is, that is why the clergy have always opposed me. And I can only conclude that part was left off the memorial in the interest of brevity. Oh, <laughs> 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 I'm talking about what you get in questionnaires. If you ask the average uh, American, uh, uh, was this uh, intended to be a Christian country? And you're judging the way people get away with that on television all the time, about 99% sure. would say yes. Absolutely. They've heard that so often and they've never heard the truth. Outside of myself? <laughs> my Johann Sebastian Bach. My mother and then Euclid. <laughs> <laughs> what is this fixation you have on Euclid? I'll tell you what it is. I'm going to call it the Euclidean complex. Yeah, you know? it is. I, I just... Yeah. It was like some people uh, say they felt when they first uh, read Ayn Rand. Uh, when I first read Euclid, when I, I was... Uh, very small. It just, it was a burst, you know, to think, good God, the human mind is capable of doing this. It really was. Yeah, it, it was, really, yeah. God, I'll say it was. The first time I realized that one equation in differential calculus applied to a system of springs with weights on them and also applied to an electrical current with uh, resistance, inductance, and capacitance in it, and that there was this simple mathematical elegant expression behind these two vastly different physical systems. I got a flash of pure Satori, and I have never understood the people who say that science destroys our capacity for mysticism. All the high experiences I had in my 20s, in my teens and 20s, were based on mathematics and structural perceptions of what's going on beneath the surface created by our sensory apparatus. And to deny this to kids, it strikes me as being the most cardinal of crimes to take these uh, naturally curious people and deny them the pleasure of discovery is, uh, that's real child abuse, real child abuse. Hmm. Well. Quite moved by what you say, and so is the hotel. In fact, uh, they want us to move to another room. How about where we can all go to sleep? Yeah. <laughs>